Well, let me say thank you again to each of you for being here this morning and for those of you who have had a part in pulling all of this together, let me express my gratitude also uh, to those leading in worship this morning, again to those who were downstairs preparing the meal, uh, who were here far earlier than I was this morning. Uh, thank you so much. And to each of you who are here this morning representing a different group in our community or just representing your branch of service, we say thank you again for being here and thank you uh, for your service uh, this morning. Well, we're excited this morning to be able to also open God's Word for you. And while we celebrate our freedom as a country and uh, those who have, uh, have uh, been a part of supplying that, we understand and believe that there is a greater freedom that is available to us in Jesus Christ. And so we take a moment to reflect on that this morning and hopefully in some way tie the two together so that we can understand God's heart and his mind for us. So let me invite you to take a Bible either out of the pew rack which is in front of you uh, or to take your Bible out this morning or to open your Bible app, whichever you are using, uh, if you're a finger swiper. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 13 if you would this morning and that's going to be our key passage. It's page uh, 1009, 1009 in the Pew Bible. You can follow along there. Um, or you can, as we head through our message this morning, take out the message guide which is available uh, for you in the program. Um, we want to take a moment and read God's Word together this morning. And uh, we will be reading from Romans chapter 13, written by Paul, and uh, looking at verses uh, 1 down through verse 7 this morning. So uh, you might have in your Bible a title at the beginning of that chapter that says to submit to government or some such, uh, uh, such, such title in there. But uh, we're going to allow God's Word to uh, speak for itself this morning as we unpack it and uh, look together at the topic of being a great Christian citizen. Beginning in verse 1, let's share in God's Word together. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do you want to uh, do what is good? And you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this you also pay taxes. For, there are, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. This is the word of God. We believe here at Bethany that this is the authoritative word of God, that everything we would not know about God, about his person and his purposes and his works, how to live in this world is revealed to us here. We believe, God, we believe God speaks through this word to us, this written word, and as we take the time to study it, as we take the time to learn this word, it shapes and it molds our lives. And it allows us to greater and greater degrees to live within his will for us. And so this morning, with regard to citizenship and with regard to governments and with regard to this country that we live, we take a moment to look in the book of Romans as Paul has shared, and in, in Romans 13 in particular, but right before this, in Romans chapter 12, uh, in verses 1 and 2, Paul writes to the Romans and he opens a door of application uh, in this section and going forth towards the end of the book of Romans of what he has spoken about prior to that. The first part of the book of Romans, just to give you some background, if you would, is largely doctrinal, it's largely theological. It speaks to the work of Christ and how Christ came and how it was God's desire that he would send his son and that his son would take our place, that he would accept the wages, that he would pay the price, that our sin, our wayward actions, our willfulness in stepping away from God, uh, that accumulated 
if you would, spiritual debt, that, that Jesus paid that debt on, on the cross for us. And he works our way, he works his way through and up to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, he begins to unpack for us how then does this apply to our lives? How do we live in light of so great a salvation that God has provided for us? What are we to do? How do we, how do we work this out? And so in those verses, it presents a truth and it says that we, in light of that, we present ourselves as living sacrifices, it says in those verses. And that we are not to be conformed to the world, but rather it says we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind through the truths of Scripture so that we might be able to know what is good and what is acceptable and to know the will of God for our lives. And so it, he says, basically, this is, this is God's will for us. For us to do otherwise invites, if you would, things that are not so good. It invites trouble. It invites conflict into our lives. It invites confusion when we're out of step with God. It, it invites disorientation in our hearts. So here he makes the point and begins to unpack that what Christ has done affects every area of our life. It affects us personally in who we are. It affects our relationships with each other within the church. And when we come to chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, he says what Christ has done and our desire to live in light of that affects the way we relate to government, to authority, to those who rule over us. And so, so here in these verses, we see that, that these ruling authorities, those that who rule our lives, God has something to say to us with regard to how we interact with them. Now, if there's any sure way to destroy or to uh, just take the air out of a dinner party or a social event, it's to talk about one of two things, isn't it? It's to talk about either religion or politics. And here this morning, I'm going to be talking about both. Because that's what this is talking about. But I hope to do it in a way that it doesn't take the, the wind out of your sails, but that it gives you something to walk away with to understand how can I live in this world, in this country, how can I live in this church, how can I live in this city, and how can I live as an individual in a way that pleases God with regard to both of these areas of my life. So, Let's take a look at Romans chapter 13. And as we do so, let me invite you to explore being a great Christian citizen. And as we do so, our transforming truth for this morning is this. It's the first glance of your life filler inner work. Is this, that politics, it may divide us. But what we want to see is that knowing Christ will unite us. Understanding God's word and his heart, his desires, his will for us, draws us together. It brings us together. It unites us. And so as we explore this morning, let's keep that in the back of our mind. It, politics may cause conflict. And let's be honest, we live in a contentious day. We live in a painful day with regard to these things. The whole political scene. But I want us to see and understand that Jesus who gave his life for us did so, so that if we too would choose to live as a living sacrifice and to follow him more than anything else, we can know peace for our lives. Now, in terms of government and just thinking this through, I, I want to kind of, if you would, um, for lack of a better word, I, I want to, we need a little bit of an on-ramp to this passage. We just can't hit it right off. So we kind of gotta, gotta if you would, you know, take the on ramp to get there. So there's a couple things I want to say that kind of lead into the points that come directly from this passage this morning. And that is uh, first this is that the mission of the church, the mission of any church should be ultimately and foremost to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to do so without embarrassment, without without reserve to do so without hesitation, that this is our first call. And, and how does that then relate to government? How does that relate to, to, if you would, authority? Well, there are those that would say that the church controls the state. 
that the church is the highest authority, therefore it controls the state. And vice versa, those who are part of the state would certainly say it's their role to control the church. In fact, being the church that we are, some of you as you came in through the college, you might have noticed they, there is implant, implanted, for lack of a better word, in the wall, the original cornerstone from the church, the first Swedish Baptist church. And in Scandinavia, particularly in the 1800s, early part of the 1900s, the churches there were under state control. And a number of those who find themselves of Scandinavian roots found their churches, whether they were from Sweden or they were from Norway, whether you were a Baptist General Conference or you were a Swedish Baptist, or you were an evangelical free, or you were from Norwegian descent, found a home in America where, without the control of the state, they were able to practice and follow God in a way that they thought was in keeping with God's word, so that they could freely accomplish the purpose of God for which the church exists, and that is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So does the church control the state, or does the state control the church? That's, that's one, one way to look at it. There's another philosophy or way to look at it that says that there should be some kind of compromise made between the two. And that the church should receive the favor of the state, and that the state should receive, if you would, uh, or be accommodated by the church, and, and we kind of stay in this kind of limbo of going back and forth, and not quite being sure which keeps which happy, and who's stepping on whose toes. But then I think there's a, sort of a third way, if you would, and I, I think that this is a more biblical way, and I think that this is what Romans chapter 13 supports, and that I believe there's a possible way of looking at the church and the state as having distinct God-given responsibilities, and that in the midst of those distinct responsibilities, they respect the roles of the other, all of them under God's authority. So that we don't have to, if you would, kind of give one favor or the other favor or whatever, but we understand the place that God has given each of us, and we work mutually in the midst of that, all of us, under the greater authority of God. And so we make that distinction, and I think we as a church should make that distinction. We don't promote particular candidates, and actually we don't take any particular political positions. Because if you would, that's outside of our authority. But rather, what we do here is we teach God's Word, and we seek to be biblical in what we teach, and we unquestionably teach the dignity of individuals as being made in the image of God. We seek justice, and we, we put forth morality as we see it and explain it and understand it from God's Word without compromise. And so we leave room in some aspects to understand that some well-intentioned believers may think a little different than us. But that the government has its role, and we, if you would, we have our role, all of those underneath the ultimate authority of God. We give space for that at Bethlehem. And we don't want to ever do anything as a church that jeopardizes us accomplishing a greater purpose, and that is the sharing of the gospel of Christ. Now, there's a second thing that I want to say with regard to, if you would, get ahead a little more of a rant. And that is in terms of the scripture passage itself that we're going to look at today. And you're already saying, man, it's 11 o'clock. And I'm looking at the clock and I'm saying, oh my, it's 11 o'clock. So I'm going to have to sum up all of this in about, well, a fewer moments than I think I, I can do it. But the other thing that I think is important to understand is that I think Paul, in writing here, notice it's the book of Romans. And so Paul here is writing with a particular audience in mind. And so I think it's, it's possible that Paul, in writing these thoughts, was writing and understood that the leaders of his day, the leaders in Rome, in the palace, would also, if you would, hear about this or be familiar, ultimately, with what he is saying here. And so he lays out for us some thinking, and the idea is that, that, that is for the Roman church, and that it will ultimately find its way to civil authorities, people like Nero, people like Caesar, people who, if you understand the day in which they lived, saw themselves as gods, and saw themselves as ultimate authorities. And so it was probably in Paul's mind that these 
thoughts would end up in their hands, and that through this, he would be explaining and helping them to understand God's intended purpose for them and what they should be doing. Probably Paul wanted Caesar to know what the intention was for Christians because he explains here what it is for Christians to do. And sometimes, let's just be honest, it's very easy for people to misread what it is that we as believers pursue and why we do the things that we do. We, we think about what we do and we should be very intentional about what we do because we have a guide for what we do. But many people don't have the guide or haven't read the guide or aren't familiar with the guide, so they scratch their heads and they say, that's a little kooky, that's a little weird, not sure why those Christian people do that. Well, it's because, fully, it's what God has shown us in his word that we should be doing as a church and what we should be doing as his followers. So there's this thought, I think, in Paul's mind that, that those who are in civilian, if you would, civil authority, are going to get their hands on this, and, and if you would, he wants them to understand that they should understand there is no authority apart from God, that the authority they have is from him, and that Christians are here to subvert that authority. In fact, Paul makes it a point to tell them that Christians are going to do some certain things to help those civil authorities. But then we have a higher law. So, with that as kind of an on ramp, let me hit, if you would, five things today, and I'm going to do them quickly. And so, I'm going to invite you to follow along, if you would. And the first thing I want us to explain and look at is, who are these authorities? Who are these civilian authorities? Who are these people that we're talking about? If you would, who, who is the government that Paul is speaking to here? And he does that beginning in verses 1 and 2. And he says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. I think for believers, God wants them to know that God is sovereign. Let me tell you what, that ought to make you feel great today. In a world and, and in a day when it seems that so much is out of control, and at times so much in our lives is just out of control. It's wonderful to know that God is in control. And Paul says, God is sovereign. He's in control. He wanted those in civil authority to know that their authority was delegated by God. The authority of Rome, the authority here in the United States of America, let's just be clear, is not self-generated. The authority that the rulers in Paul's day had, the Caesars or Nero or whoever, any of the presidents that we have ever had as a country, none of that authority is self-generated. They have authority because God has given them authority and God is sovereign. That's why they have authority. Because God is the ultimate authority. That's where their authority comes from. God is the one who institutes government, and he does it for his purposes in the world. No authority exists apart from God. So what does that mean for you and for me? Well, the first thing that I thought about was that if I need to recognize all authority in my life is part of God's plan. Now, let's just be honest. There are some times, if you would, when authority is exercised on me, I don't like it. If I were to be pulled over for speeding, if I were, I wouldn't let it. But that authority exists for my good. And that authority, authority exists because God has placed that authority there for my good and for the accomplishing of his purposes. Not too long from now, we're going to click into a new year which means we're going to have to start thinking about something we don't like to think about. You know what that is. Taxes. I don't like that. I don't like those sheets of paper. I don't like when I see those numbers there. I don't like to have to figure those things and find those things and sort those receipts and, and come up with this and, and 
and to sit there and, and at times struggle with the issue of integrity. I like that. That's extra, <coughs> authority being exercised, if you would, on me. But I have to sit there and recognize that all authority in my life is a part of his plan. And so here's another thought. It could be, and it probably is true, that in some way, shape, or form, you have a measure of authority. Either through your employment, with the place in your family, or through some other relationship. Let me ask you this. How are you acting as an authority in someone else's life? God is the one who raises up authority. He is the one who places them in people's lives. God is giving you authority from him and under him. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 28, and I'm actually going to just let you see that those verses are there, Jesus speaks, and he says that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. He goes on, therefore, and says, Go, therefore, speaking to us, and make disciples, he says, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus, the King of Kings, he stood before Pontius Pilate before his crucifixion, and Pilate said, why don't you speak to me? Don't you understand? He said, don't you understand that I can save your life? And Jesus is standing before him quiet, and ultimately Jesus responds, John 19. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And so Jesus even recognizes that, that and that's a profound statement. You can't crucify me, Jesus says, unless my Father lets you. There's no authority except from God. Second, let me suggest this, or ask the question, what is the purpose of this authority? Well, he makes it pretty clear. Verses 3 and 4 for us. He says this, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be un unafraid of, the, of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the saints. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. The role and the purpose of governance, of authority, is actually people. First, it's this. It's to bring order. It's to bring order. The idea is we don't want chaos. We want order. We want order in our society. And without authority, without governance, there would be chaos. If you think about the scriptures in different places, what if everyone does what is right in their own eyes? What do we have? It's a disaster. We see that in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges. That people are doing whatever they wanted to. Every person is doing what was right in their own eyes. So governance and authority brings order. It also brings justice, it says. It brings justice for those who are perpetrated against. It brings judgment on the perpetrator. Government has the authority to punish evil and to take those who are lawbreakers and punishing them, restrain them, and to keep them from ruling the day. Paul's point here is do what is good, and it's going to go well with you. But if you do what's bad, don't be surprised. Because God has given people authority, and, and it's not in vain. They are there to restrain that evil. Authority is good and bad of being used by God, and authority is a part of how God uses to bring about order and justice. Paul shares. Third, let me share quickly this. Why do we submit to authority? Why do we submit? Why is it that I... Why is it that I pull over to the side when I see the peace officer following behind me? Why is it that when my W-2s come and, this, and April 15th is close, I know what to do and what I need to be doing? Why is that? He 
says this, verse 5, Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, not only because of what they can do to you, but also for conscience sake. He says for conscience sake. We obey for conscience sake because authority is from God. It's our call to love good and to hate evil. If we are citizens first of his kingdom and then here of an earthly kingdom, we live as humans under human authority, but understand that authority comes from him, and therefore if we go against human authority, we are violating our relationship with him. And if you would, our conscience is not only pricked <coughs> once, but it's pricked twice. And the second time is in a much larger way. Jesus, when he was spoken to at one point, he was asked a question, he said, if my kingdom were of this world, my people um, would be fighting. He said, if I was a civil, if mine was all about just here, then I, my, my followers would have the sword out. Do you remember in the garden, and I just thought about this, do you remember in the garden, when the soldiers come to get Jesus, and the, and, and the disciple pulls his sword, Matthew, I believe it is, if I remember correctly, he pulls his sword and he lops off the ear of the servant of the high priest who's come. He lops off Malchus, Mal, Malchus's, Malchus's ear, I believe. His name is Malchus. And what does Jesus do? He says, hey, that's not my, that's not the way that we run here. He says, and he takes and he heals the servant. Put away that sword. He said, if my kingdom were an earthly kingdom, he said, then we'd be running around with swords. But he says, that's not my kingdom. He says, that's not the way it is for me and my kingdom and my heavenly father. In 1 Peter chapter 2, this is what he says. And he who, pardon me, and, he, uh, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. He's making the case here. It is good to be under authority and law-abiding. God, God understands that, and that's good. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Have your conscience be free. Always be ready to give a defense of everyone who asks you reason for the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear, having a good conscience. And when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ, may be ashamed, for it is better if it is, uh, if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. He makes that point there. We do it for conscience sake. Why? Because we serve the Lord. We are under authority. Why? Because it honors God and it keeps our conscience clear. It's similar language to Romans 13. Peter and Paul here are calling the church to live in an exemplary way under authority. Humbly. Rightfully submissive, God-fearing, spirit-filled, seeking good. We do it for conscience sake. We honor the king, and ultimately, in so doing, we honor, most importantly, the king of kings. We're going to skip the verse there that continues on and look at the fourth idea. So how do we submit to this authority? So what does that look like for us? You know, sometimes, in today's day, I think it's kind of confusing. You know, and there's probably a whole lot that I could say here, but I'm only going to throw out there just a couple of things, and certainly should be the things that Paul says here, and be a part of doing that. He says in verses 6 and 7, those last two parts of that, this chapter, for because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, Honor to whom? Honor. So how do we submit? Well, the first thing he says here is we pay our taxes. I said, man, couldn't we start with something a little bit easier to swallow, Paul? Oh, gosh. We pay our taxes. We raise respect and we honor others. As believers, we choose purposely to be honest, to be ethical, to be moral, to be upright in our business dealings. To be like Christ in the community. Now it's interesting, in the first century, and when this was written, there were Christians called zealots, or there were zealots, zelotes, in Jerusalem. 
And Rome was the rule of the land, and they didn't like the Romans. And the Jews, they hated Rome, and, and, and so they hated the strong hand of Rome, and so they came back. And they said, why, why in the world would we pay taxes to Rome? Why do we know it? And they refused. The Jews in Rome had all kinds of insurrections and murders and all types of assassinations. They refused to pay taxes. And so what Paul is saying here is it's just like unheard of them. But if we keep up the idea that Paul probably thought that the, the Caesars and the, the civil leaders of his day were going to see this, he wanted it to be clear to them that Christians that were truly Christians would be people who honored the civilian authorities and paid taxes. And were not insurrectionists. And we're not assassinators. That they were people who worked within the framework of the civil authority, even in the midst of a greater authority. Paul says, you, you as Christians are different. You pay your taxes. You live for the gospel. You honor those in authority. A couple other things let me suggest here. First, you ought to vote. You ought to vote. You want to take your given ability to be a part of the process, if you would, on the other side and vote. I don't think it's right for a Christian not to vote. You want to vote and be a part of that. And second, and most importantly, you need to pray. You need to pray. And one of the things that we encourage you to do is to pray, to pray for our leaders to pray for those who have authority over us. That God would, would, that would give his grace to those individuals and that they would be sensitive to his call, God's call on their lives. We honor, we respect, we pay taxes, we pray, we vote. But that brings up another question that's the last, and we're going to end with it. Should we ever not submit to authority? Where, if you would, if we're talking about what well, God's plan is for the church, and God's plan is for government or civil authority. When does one say no if you went to the other? And is there a time to do so? Should we ever not submit? Do we just follow blindly? Absolutely not. Is there obedience in everything? To Christ, yes, but to civil authorities? Not in everything. And is there a time of not submitting, therefore, is right? I'm going to say yes. But when is that? Let me share this with you. And I took the time to order it because I want to get it clear. I want you to hear it clear. In a word, it is simply this. When authority asks us to do something that God forbids, or forbids that we do something that God commands, we must stand up and say no. When it is that we are asked to do something that God forbids, or we are forbidden to do something that God commands, it is then that we stand up and we say, we have no king but Jesus. We have no king but Jesus. There's examples of this in scripture. You could write them down. Daniel chapter 3, we know about the three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who chose rather to be obedient to God than to civil authorities, and ended up where? in the fiery furnace. And God met them in the fiery furnace and blessed them and protected them in the midst of their obedience. We also know Daniel chapter 6, when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den because he continued to pray and to worship God each day as he knew God wanted him to. And Nebuchadnezzar did what? He had to throw him in the lion's den and God protected him. And the testimony of God's protection changed the life of Nebuchadnezzar. And those, religious, those, those governmental leaders who, if you would, put the fix on Daniel ultimately ended up giving their lives to fill the bellies of the lions. And Daniel was exalted, and his God was exalted. Exodus chapter 1, another place. Acts chapter 5, another place. Choosing to be obedient to God. And in so doing, what do we find? We bless the place where God has us living. Jeremiah 29. Seek the peace of the city, where I have caused you to be carried away captive. Pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. So how do we choose today to be great Christian citizens? 
We honor those in authority. We understand that all authority is given by God. That in some way, shape, or form, all of us are in authority and need to examine ourselves and to see how we do that. That we live that out in such a way that our conscience is free. That we pay our taxes. We honor others. That we lift up the gospel so that others may know the God that we serve. Whether in this church, or in this community, or in this country, may it be that we can grow to understand better what God's desire is for us as Christians. And that we would choose to be, learn to be great Christian citizens. It will make an incredible difference in the world around us. If we choose to be what God wants us to be, and we live in a way that honors Him with those, if you would, in that other sphere of influence, that God help us to figure out what that looks like. Father, we thank you for this morning. And Paul knew that living out being a Christ follower was not an easy thing, particularly in his day. And so, Lord, we recognize today, at least for us, figuring out what it means and looks like to be a Christian and to live like a Christian, to be a Christian citizen and to be a great one, that's, that can be hard. And so we pray and we ask for your strength. We pray and we ask for your insight and your direction so that, God, as we walk, and learn that you might be glorified in our midst, in our communities, and in our country. Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for those that we have celebrated today who have given us the freedom. And Lord, given me, in some sense, the freedom to say the things that I've just said. And Lord, we pray and we ask that above all of these things, we might recognize your role as our King of kings and Lord of lords, the ultimate authority, and that God, we might daily, in the midst of each and everything that we do, kneel and give you our ultimate service. Thank you for these moments we've had today. In Jesus' name. Amen.